Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Tesla Motors first quarter 2013 financial results Q&A conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session, and instructions will follow at that time. As a reminder, this conference call is being recorded. I would like to turn the call over to your host, Jeff Evanson, from Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, Patrick, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our first quarter financial results question and answer conference call. I'm joined today by Elon Musk, Tesla's chairman and CEO, and Deepak Ahuja, Tesla's chief financial officer. We announced our financial results for the first quarter shortly after the close of trading today. The shareholder letter, financial results, and webcast of this Q&A session are all available at our investor relations website at ir.teslamotors.com. Today's call is for your questions, and we will conduct the Q&A session live, so please press star 1 now if you would like to ask a question. Like last quarter, we will limit this call to 45 minutes. During the course of this call, we may discuss our business outlook and make forward-looking statements. Such statements are predictions based on management's current expectations. Actual results or events could differ materially due to a number of risks and uncertainties, including those mentioned in our most recent 10-K filed with the SEC. Such forward-looking statements represent our views as of today and should not be relied upon after today. We also disclaim any obligation to update these forward-looking statements. And now, Patrick, could we please have the first question? Our first question comes from Ben Schumann from Pacific Press Securities. Your line is open. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking the call, and uh, congratulations on the, the great deliveries and results in the quarter. Um, I guess my first question is around the, the dev credits. You disclosed the amount of revenue in Q1. Can you say how much is implied in the Q2 gross margin guidance? And uh, kind of as part of that, what are some of the big gross margin drivers to get from that 5% level now, excluding the dev revenue, to 25%? And do you expect that 25% uh, also without whatever positive impact from the lease accounting that you might see. Uh, okay, a few questions that's in there. Um, yeah, so we are expecting a decline in debt credit revenue for Q2 um, and then probably you know, a fairly significant decline in, in Q3. And as I said, like right now, we're not expecting anything in Q4. Um, it, but that's not to say that, that, I mean, there might be uh, some, some debt credit revenue in Q4, but we're not counting on it. Um, I, I don't know. I, I can't give any more precision than, than that at this time. Um, the okay, so a bigger decline in Q3 than in Q2, is it fair to say that? Oh, sure, of course, yeah. Okay, and then um, just one more from me. The $200 million in CapEx, um, can you talk about just what that's going to exactly, maybe how much of the gross margin improvement might be tied to additional capital expenditures? Um, uh, ben Deepak here. Clearly, some of the... Uh, CapEx is related to uh, uh, improvements we are making in-house by bringing more equipment in and automating our processes that uh, results in gross margin improvement. And, and a, a portion of that is also uh, new product development, and then another portion is the uh, infrastructure development of our service centers, our stores, and the supercharger network. Yeah, I mean, it's worth noting that we're, we're profitable in Q1 despite actually spending quite a lot of, of money on new service centers, um, expanding the supercharge network, stores, and, and other things that obviously won't, we won't need to keep doing. Uh, I mean, that, that, that's you know, not something that's going to need to occur on an ongoing basis. Um, but, but, but we need to we need to establish a service network in particular, for example. Great, thanks a lot. All right. Our next question comes from Dan Galvez with Deutsche Bank. Your line is open. No, thanks for taking my questions. Um, uh, first one, uh, again, uh, kind of regarding the gross margin, um, you know, I did this, I think, the same simple math that Ben did to get to somewhere in the 5 to 6% gross margin, uh, automotive gross margin, um, excluding the ZEP credits. Um, you know, if that's in the ballpark, it seems like you need to increase uh, gross profit per unit by, you know, some, something in the, you know, seventeen to $19,000 per unit. 
by the end of the year, wondering if you could give us kind of the big bucket, big buckets that you're targeting um, for that improvement and, uh, you know, how much is within your control and how much might be uh, you might need uh, price concessions from your suppliers, if any. Sure. Um, well, first, it's worth noting that when you see the gross margin for Q1, uh, we're giving you, the, the, obviously, the gross margin average over the quarter. Um, and so the, the gross margin at the end of Q1 was significantly better than at the beginning of Q1. Um, so it, uh, you, know, you may sort of think, oh, we're starting from a base of 5 or 6%, but actually we're starting from a base at, that's, that's, that's a fair bit better than that. Um, and, uh, and then in terms of where the additional uh, cost savings are coming from, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a wide range of activities. Most of these have been put in place um, either in Q4 last year or, or, or in Q1, but it takes time for those uh, actions to bear fruit. They, they, don't, they don't happen instantly. Um, and, and it's it, like this wide range. It's, it's uh, improving um, at the cost of our logistics, improving, you know, get, getting better deals from suppliers, um, uh, design improvements. Those are the ones, design improvements are the ones that take the longest to uh, come to fruition, which is why um, we, you know, we're only confident of the 25% gross margin number in Q4, not sooner, is because there are a number of improvements that are design related. So you've got to, you know, you've got to finish the design, you've got to uh, validate it, and uh, and then put it into production. So um, and I'll add to that manufacturing process improvements, both in house and at our suppliers. Yeah. Things cost out. Yeah. Um, I mean, a number of our suppliers have really done done some impressive work on cost reduction. Um, and um, you know, for some and, and for some others, they they just didn't believe that we'd do these numbers, so they they didn't um, didn't quite uh, tool up for this level of production um, because that, their their own internal predictions were that we would do in some cases three thousand over the entire lifetime of the product. <laughs> we're like, uh, yeah, we did that last quarter, so um, so they sort of have to believe that those things. That, that these projections are real, then they actually tool up and are able to deliver significant cost savings for uh, part supply. Okay, gotcha. So just to, just to follow up, um, the suppliers are cooperating with you um, in terms of, uh, you know, reduce it. So I guess are you still experiencing a lot of premium freight um, from suppliers that weren't ready to, to produce at volume? Are they cooperating with you in terms of the design improvements and, and kind of re- designing the, 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 the component. And then, um, you know, my second question relates to cash flow. Uh, what is, um, what's causing the, the decline from $65 million of OCF in uh, Q1 to the guidance of neutral in Q2? And if you could remind us of your, your minimum cash level. And thanks. Um, so to, to answer your first question, our expedited freight is continuing to reduce every month that goes by as uh, both our suppliers have additional capacity to meet our needs and our production schedule is becoming much more stable. So it's all trending in the right direction. And then uh, to that same point of Elon, where we ended with our freight costs at the end of Q1 was better than the average uh, for the quarter. So it gives us comfort that uh, or confidence that we'll continue uh, to reduce our costs. And then in terms of... Uh, uh, our cash flows, uh, you know, we are uh, mindful of uh, the volumes. As, as you can see, we are projecting uh, lower deliveries in North America since we have quite a few cars on the board being shipped to Europe. And that's a, that, that consumes some degree of working capital, which becomes a part of our cash flow from operations. And that's a significant number. So when you combine the lower deliveries because you're producing for Europe and the fact that we have these cars on the board, that has an impact. Okay, perfect. Thanks a lot. Our next question comes from Aditya Sidgari with Lazard Capital Markets. Your line is open. Add to uh, first on the manufacturing process. You talked about the number of uh, manufacturing hours being reduced by 40%. Can you give us a sense of how much more room is there to go and where does that stand in relation to your target? And then I have a follow-up. Uh, I think there's clearly room to go further. And... Um, uh, there are a lot of activities in our manufacturing organization that's, that are continuing uh, in that direction. And then towards 
the uh, second half of the year as we start to increase our production rate uh, slightly further than our present levels that will further add to the uh, labor reduction on a per unit basis. Uh, got it. Uh, second question on demand. When you when you talk about the 15,000 uh, uh, 15, units per year, does that include both sort of cash and lease demand? And could you also give us some more color on when we think about the 15,000 non-U.S. units, what geographies do you expect that demand to come from? And maybe a little bit more color on the buyer base, of sort of, you know, who, is, who potentially could be buying these cars. Um, yeah, we actually expect probably most of our <clears throat> most of our purchases long term will will be finance purchases, which is actually normal for premium sedans. They're, they're most they're majority financed. Um, and in fact, in, in our case, it might end up being a super majority because I think that the, the best way to appreciate the savings you get from gasoline is is to uh, look at it on a monthly basis. Um, in the U.S., you, know, you maybe save two to $300 a month in gasoline relative to electricity costs um, if it's your daily driver. In, in Europe, obviously, that, that number can, can be double. You know, it could be maybe $500 a month um, in, if, if you're um, driving Europe because the cost of gasoline is twice as, as much. So, um, so I think, you know, given, given that, I think it, we'll see over time, my guess is that it will be a supermajority um, financed in one form or another. Um, and, and I believe that also opens up the potential uh, the, the affordability of the car to a much broader, um, a much larger number of people. Um, and I think if, if, like if, if our car was exclusively available for purchase and not, not, not by financing, I think that's maybe uh, accessible to, uh, you know, 1% or roughly one, r roughly 1 million U.S. households. As a finance product with the right financing, in a, a sort of fully optimized financing product, I think it's probably accessible to the top 10 million households. Um, and, uh, you know, and then, of course, it depends on what percentage of, house, of those households will want to buy our car versus somebody else's. Uh, but I do think that, that it's, you know, long term, it's a primarily finance product. And, and could you touch on sort of non-U.S. demand in terms of uh, geographical mix and uh, where it comes from? Yeah, um, sure. Well, um, I, I think we'll see, you know, probably uh, at least 10,000 units a year from demand in, in Europe. Um, uh, and then at least 5,000 in Asia, but I, but I mean, that could be obviously a much bigger number. China's kind of a wild card here. Um, it's worth noting that all of the cars, all the sales to date, uh, including all the way through end of Q2, is 100% North American. Um, great, thank you. Our next question comes from Adam Jonas with Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Ron, um, I know I've asked you the, uh, versions of this question before, um, and you guys have done a phenomenal job building uh, what appears to be a viable business and a, and a thriving business, uh, although so early, uh, and at a risky part of the, of the life cycle of a company. So to kind of, you know, when you, when you look at where your share price is and is likely to be tomorrow, and you think about the factors that are outside of your control um, to, to kind of make sure that all this great work your team has done doesn't go to waste, potentially, for those factors outside of your control. Can you share your thoughts on potentially socking in, you know, padding the balance sheet a bit more with a, a capital increase that um, could you know, further improve your chances to keep, keep investing in the business and focusing on the product and not the economic cycle? Sure. Uh, well, we don't have any plans right now to raise funding. Um, essentially, we're, you know, we, you know, we expect to be, or we were positive cash flow in Q1, and we expect to be you know, relatively sort of neutral on cash flow in Q2. Um, but, uh, you know, it's always possible that we could be optimistic about raising around. Um, but, but there's no, like we've spent no time on that at all. Um, so um, if, if we were to do a round, it would be, for the reasons that you mentioned, you know, which is to ensure that uh, if there was some uh, unexpected supply interruption, you know, some sort of force yeah. majeure event, yeah, the, you know, to, to essentially protect against the force majeure event that, that there could be some merit to, uh, to doing a round. Okay, that's very clear, Elon. Thank you. And just a follow-up to an earlier question about the geographic split, 
Uh, don't know if you can give any color of the 21,000 that you expect this year, how much in by order of magnitude could come from Europe, and to confirm whether there'd be any Asian numbers in, in that in this year's figure. Thank you. Well, I mean, obviously, given that the first half of the year is entirely North America, that that obviously puts a floor of 10,000. If we stop shipping to North America on on you know July 1st, then we would still have you know something like 10,000 North American cars. So we're not obviously not going to do that. Um, so we're you know. It's probably just do not take these numbers as 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 final in any way. But you just have, if I'm asked to sort of speculate, I mean it's probably something like fifteen thousand in North America um, and five and, and five thousand in Europe and one thousand in Asia. But this is you know don't hold me to these numbers. So I would right. want to you know when I to say stuff, I want to bracket it with the appropriate confidence interval. Um, that's that's my best guess. Those could numbers could be different. Understood, Elon. Thank you very much. All right. The next question comes from Patrick Archambault with Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Um, yeah, great. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, yeah, congratulations on on a good quarter. Um, you know, just on 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 the sales number. Um, you know, I mean, if you if if you are selling. Um, you know, as you say, um, above the um, you know the the twenty thousand um, you know per year mark right now, um, you know that kind of implies about you know at least fifty five a day. Um, you know, while we were still able to get you know kind of the the sequenced reservation data in February, you know, I believe that fell you know as low as the mid thirties. So, you know, it's come up quite a bit. Um, you know, which is which is obviously great. Um, I was hoping you could put a little bit more color on that. You know, how much of that is, you know, how much of an impact, uh, you know, have you seen since the introduced, since the introduction of the new finance product? You know, I'm sure there's some seasonality that we need to think about and, and, you know, um, you know, what's, what's, what's the contribution to some of the international sales in, in this acceleration? Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, our focus has been sort of more on, just operating efficiently as a company and building cars that and you know, and consistently improving the gross margin, um, as well as ensuring we have really good service. Um, got to be an okay service. We're, we're working hard on making it on making service great. Uh, and, you know, I I think um, I think you know we haven't really tried to push volume super hard yet, um, because I think you need to make sure that the house is in order. Um, and the car is being made as efficiently as it can be made before you try to push volume. Um, so that's, you know, why we haven't tried to do that. I think I think there's potential for, you know, next year, you know, you know fairly significant increase in volume um, as we really sort of tap the, the – you know, test the depth of the demand that's out there. I, I think it's probably quite a bit higher than, uh, than, than we'd originally thought. Um, but, but like I said, we, we, we don't want to just ramp volume and, and even and, but not have taken care of uh, gross margin or uh, you know have bad service and, and and just dump a ton of product on the market. I don't think that's sort of the wise course of action. Um, but but we'll, we'll still exceed, I think, what, what most people are expecting us to do. Okay, and if I can, just one quick follow-up on that. I mean, did you, I know it's still early, but have you seen um, a pretty good pickup, uh, you know, from uh, the introduction of the uh, of the new finance product? Yeah, I, we've definitely seen um, a meaningful improvement in demand as a result of the, the financing product. I think that's, that's had quite a, an effect on people. Um, yeah, I mentioned sort of in the, in the, some, some prior, so it talks like, that, like at, at Silver City, we saw just a monster increase in demand when it went from selling people solar systems as a purchase product versus as a finance product. It was really a, an order of magnitude difference in, in in demand as a finance product versus versus purchased. I'm not saying we'll see you know anything on that that scale at, at Tesla, but I, I, I do think it's going to be pretty significant in in its effect. 
That's helpful. If I can just squeeze one more, if that's okay. Just, uh, you know, I, I know your guidance for the 25%, um, you know, doesn't include ZEF credits for the fourth quarter, but, um, you know, yeah, I don't know. How, can you help us just bracket that possibility that there might be some, uh, you know, are you in talks with, I mean, clearly you have the volume to, to, to have, you know, further ZEV credits, obviously. Are you in talks with other manufacturers, um, you know, for these kinds of credits? I mean, is there any kind of, you know, feeling of, 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 of probability that you can give us that would, uh, you know, allow us to sort of uh, handicap that? I mean, I think I would realistically handicap it at zero for, for the fourth quarter. Okay. Um, which is not, I mean, we're, we're, you know, we'll, we'll sell it if we can, but but uh, honestly, we, we, we anticipate saturating demand for for zero credits probably in the third quarter. So maybe that's not true, but but it, 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 but I wouldn't, uh, for purposes of modeling our financials, I think, I would recommend uh, assuming zero for their credits in Q4. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, guys. Right. Our next question comes from Brian Johnson from Barclays. Your line is open. Two topics. Um, your customer segmentation, but before that, just some more data points if you can provide them on the factory. Can you give us a sense um, of you know, what the overtime hours or temp labor hours were, say, run rate exiting December versus run rate March. I noticed your inventory was flat, even though obviously revenue was way up. What you're doing in inventory, and then how does that kind of lead to some of the gross margin improvement you're talking about? Um, sure. Well, well, I mean, people were working really at the sort of 78-hour week level in – at the end of Q4, um, you know, now they're sort of down under 50 hours a week, um, and we've also been able to um, re release a lot of the, the temp labor that we we'd added um, to deal with uh, manufacturing efficiency. Uh, Deepak, do you want to add something on the inventory for Yeah, and just to clarify, Brian, that our inventory was down by $30 million compared to um, end of uh, the year, despite the fact that our production rate uh, was significantly up, and that's clearly as a result of us better managing uh, our inventory and our production processes. And on the marketing side, do you have a sense yet or data around what the other cars in your customer's garage are or sort of what the other automakers would call conquests, what they own before versus what they're Buying <clears throat> trading, if any, associated with the Tesla. I know you don't do formal trade-ins, but just what are the other cars that your sec your customers typically own? Pretty wide range. Yeah, I mean, we haven't got a, a formal study across all of our customers, but we saw some study over a narrow time period, and it was very interesting to see there was literally across the entire gamut uh, of price points and uh, brands. So we feel pretty good about that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it just seems to be based on fundamental affordability rather than any particular prior car that they had. So. Our next question comes from Elaine Clay with Jeffries. Your line is open. Hi, guys. Congratulations on the, the great uh, progress there. Uh, I was actually wondering how development on the Model X is progressing at this point. Um, you know, if, if any of that 200 million CapEx is going to the X and if any R&D is there as well, and is the launch still for early 2014? Uh, well, we, we certainly are making progress on the Model X. Uh, focus um, in the second quarter is to, is to finalize the design, um, you know, so, so the in, internal ergonomics and the, and the shape of the car. Um, uh, it, it, is, it isn't yet our top focus because our, our top focus is on improving the efficiency of Model S production and, and service. Um, but it will become our top focus towards the end of this year. Um, we, are, we are expecting to start production of Model, Model X towards the, the end of next year rather than the beginning. So, I don't know, but I think, I think we've already stated that uh, a few times. So. That's right. So I don't think that's just for everyone else listening, that's, that's not new news. Right. 
All right, that's right. Um, and, and actually on the, the, the production efficiencies with the, the raw material decline um, in the quarter, um, how much of that was volume versus you know, just better purchasing strategies or negotiating with, um, with, with, with suppliers uh, or benefit from lower commodities? And um, how much more benefit do you think there would be to be gained there? Well, I think the biggest chunk was uh, volume. Um, clearly, as our cost per unit goes down, the um, absolute amount of inventory we carry for the same number of cars is coming down. Uh, but I think uh, it, it was primarily us managing our inventory better, and, and that was contributing towards um, our lower working capital and improvement in our cash flows. Okay. Great. And, and just, I guess, last one real quick. Um, what is the, do you have a picture of what the 60 kilowatt power mix looks like at this point, and are most people taking the supercharger option on that? Thank you. Um, well, I, we, we, we do think that the mix of 60 kilowatt hour is going to increase. We think more people will, will buy it. And, and it's, I mean, long term, I think, I think it's, it might be a majority of people buy the 60 kilowatt hour version. Um, but, uh, you know, thus far it's been sort of more like at the kind of 35% level on, on, on the 60 kilowatt hour car. Um, but like I said, I think that's going to increase. And I think it's sort of roughly half of people are enabling supercharger at the time of purchase. But I think that, that number is likely to, I think that may increase in the, in the future. And it's certainly you can enable the, the supercharger at any time. Uh, after buying the car for a slight, slightly higher amount. So I think over time most 60 kilowatt hour cars will enable, will have the supercharger enabled either by the initial buyer or, or future buyer. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Our next question comes from Andrea James with Dowdy and Company. Your line is open. Just to kind of follow up a little bit. Um, you know, you sort of put aside the Model X and the Gen 3. You know, you're focusing your resources on getting the Model S right and taking the cost out. And I guess what metrics do you look at internally, you know, where you can say, okay, this product progress is satisfactory. Let's let's start diverting more resources onto the next stage of Tesla. Uh, well, we're, we're already uh, doing that. We're actually already diverting resources onto the next stage. So it, that, that'll that, – that'll Keep increasing through this quarter and, and, and next, and you know probably by sometime next quarter, middle or end of next quarter, um, our future products will be our priority because we'll, we'll be where we need to be, or at least the you know, we'll have done the things we need to, to do in order for the in order to achieve our gross margin numbers, um, and uh, and then you know once we once. Because of the time taken from when you know you get the parts are ordered to arriving to being put in a car, car gets built, loaded to a customer, and we receive a check. There's kind of a couple months in there. So even when we've made a cost improvement, it takes call it six to eight weeks for that cost improvement to actually show up in our quarterly, you know, in our financials. Um, so um, so even though um, you know you see that. Uh, unless we really screw the pooch, you'll see the 25% gross margin number in, in Q4. The actions necessary to take that will actually have been completed in Q3, um, which means that we will, in Q3, um, have turned to Model X um, and other things as our priority. Sir. I think that's helpful, and it does give us a sense of where, you know, the confidence is coming from. I just um, – just like on the lease accounting and on the financing program, can you give us a sense of maybe, you know, are you going to update your gap guidance and um, what sort of the take rate that, that, you, that you're expecting um, on, on the financing program? So, and so far, we are seeing about 25% take rate, but as Elon said, we'll continue to see an increase uh, in the take rate. Uh, and I thought, yeah, actually, there's a difference between our financing program and, and financing in general because a lot of customers uh, will finance through an institution that's not us. Um, I, I, would, I mean, I think, I think our, the total number of extended cars being financed is probably half-ish, of which half of those are through the Tesla financing program in partnership with Wells Fargo and U.S. Bank. Um, so... You know, that's, that's a 
guess, the way to think about it. But, but like I said, I do think that the percentage of finance purchases will increase, both yep. Tesla finance and uh, third-party finance. Okay, thank you. There's one more. Does, does the word cancellation mean anything anymore now that you're changing how you do your reservation? Uh, are you still taking a down payment and then locking them in? Can you just talk a little bit about how, that, you know, how that's changed? Yeah. Um, so now we, we've changed the buy flow because previously it was uh, it, it was kind of a, an arduous buy flow. We were making it hard for people to hard for people to buy the car. You, you, so you, do, you put down a five thousand dollar reservation without actually configuring the car or knowing how much it costs, and then a lot of people would kind of get shocked by oh, you know, if, you, if you add all the options you want, it's more expensive than you think. So then they cancel. So now we we, we don't do that. Um, and uh, since April second, we've. Um, if you don't order the car with the configuration that you want, you've got two weeks to uh, change that configuration or cancel, and then after two weeks, the deposit becomes uh, non-refundable and the configuration is locked. Um, so that's sort of how things are working now. Um, and the deposit is still... I, 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 should, I should mention, we are, we, are, we are thinking of reducing the initial deposit number. Um, uh, because we don't we don't really need the cash at this point, and um, when when somebody puts down 5k, they we've got to pay credit card processing fees on that, so uh, it's kind of an unnecessary cost. So we are thinking about reducing it from 5,000 to some lower number. We haven't made a final decision on that, but I think it probably makes sense just in terms of cost reduction. It's helpful. Thank you. Our next question comes from. John Lavallo with Merrill Lynch. Your line is open. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking the call. Uh, first question would be, I guess, on um, lease accounting. Can you help us understand, you know, the potential effect on margins? And, and also, I think you mentioned that there would be no cash flow impact on that. Um, but, I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't receivables naturally increase with this? Can you just help me understand that? Yeah. So, no, receivables wouldn't increase because uh, – now, this is a retail sale. Um, we get the full cash for selling this car up front. This is not a lease sale, per se. Uh, the reason we are taking lease accounting is because we are offering this resale value guarantee at the end of it, and for the price, you know, technically... Yeah, it's a pseudo lease. It's not, it's not a, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, our receivables don't go up uh, on our balance sheet. Uh, our income statement is affected because we have to amortize our revenue and the cost over a period of uh, 36 months in this case for retail value guarantee. So uh, the interesting thing is from a margin point of view as a percentage, there's really not a significant impact, but obviously the absolute dollar amount of the margin is lower since you're not recognizing the entire income up front. Yeah, I mean, actually, I mean, our margins slightly improve uh, with financing versus a purchase. Um, because we, we share in the uh, interest revenue that's generated by the by the Tesla partner, Tesla finance partners. So, um, yeah. But okay, we, great. Uh, yeah, so we get the full cash up front as, as well. In fact, we get like basically like, slightly more cash than if it was a purchase. So. Okay, and then in terms of the the. Um to the 25% gross margin target in the fourth quarter. Now, was this always kind of an exit rate, the 25%, or is this kind of a change in, in, in stance? Um, no, no, no change really. Um, I mean, I'd say we're we think we think we'll be at 25% on average for all of Q4. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm like. I'm fairly certain we'll be uh, at 25% before the end of Q4, and I think it's likely that we'll be at 25% on average in Q4. Okay. Thanks very much, guys. Okay. Patrick, unfortunately, we probably only have time for one more questioner. Our next question comes from Ryan Brinkman with J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. Hi, this is actually Amy Carroll for uh, Ryan Brinkman. Uh, good quarter. I just had a quick question regarding uh, foot traffic and stores. Um, just wondering, you know, what you guys are seeing and if you could kind of uh, help us think about uh, when these people come through the stores, what you're seeing in percentage of conversion rate. Um, also, I think in the first quarter, 
uh, you mentioned that some of the higher costs was related to, um, you know, not things not going out perfectly through the door, if you're still seeing that. And, you know, I know your servicing business is kind of still early, but uh, what are you seeing in terms of, like, usage um, and, you know, kind of just giving us a little bit more color on that? That would be appreciated. Um, okay, I'm not sure I totally understand the question, but... Um, the first I'm question was just basically, okay. like, when somebody comes to the door, how through yeah. your stores, like what you're converting in terms of like actual sales? Well, we have a huge number of people come through our stores. I mean, uh, usually in excess of a million people per quarter. Yeah. That's for our new design stores that we have. So, I mean, our stores are in high demand. Okay, it's a low, it's a low percentage conversion, yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, they bring a lot of people in and educate them about Tesla and the brand and the yeah. EV. So, that's our marketing strategy, which is different from a typical car company. And so, uh, just a typical metric of conversion of foot traffic is not exactly applicable. I mean, there's a lot of people that buy a t shirt. Um, I mean, our, re our apparel sales are actually not bad. <laughs> um, and I think we could do, do, do a lot more in that, on that front. Um, I mean, we actually have millions of dollars in apparel sales, um, but, but uh, without, without really trying, trying hard. Um, I, I, I think probably a better metric would be conversion after, of a qualified lead after a test drive. Um, and, you know, we're seeing something like 25% uh, conversion after a test drive, which is quite, quite high. That's, that's okay, and then just like um, on the on the service front, if you're you're seeing like what percentage of uh, people using it, what are some of the more common issues um, on that? Um, yeah. Um, well, we like to as, as if, you know we're the service announcement. Our service. It's been okay, but not great. But it's, I think it's improving swiftly with each passing week. Um, and we did have some some issues there with uh, you know we put quite a fancy door handle, and occasionally the sensor would malfunction on the door handle. So uh, you'd pull on the door handle and it wouldn't open. Um, obviously, it's quite vexing for a customer. Um, but um, we've, we've addressed that at, at root cause, and so. Um, yeah, essentially, the door handle incidents have gone to virtually zero uh, since we introduced the kind of new version of the, the door handle, um, and then we're retroactively addressing door handle issues uh, or, or addressing you know, for, for the fleet that's on the road. We're, we're, we're kind of fixing the door handles, um, which in, in a lot of cases just can, can be done with a remote firmware update. Um, so. Um, I mean, it's, I think since door handle has been an issue, we've actually ironically had an issue with the 12 volt lead acid battery. There's a little 12 volt lead acid auxiliary battery um, that um, we, we bought from quite a reputable supplier, uh, American company, who then outsourced it to China, who then outsourced it to Vietnam. Um, and so we thought we were getting, you know, fairly good good battery, but. Uh, you know, by the time it had been outsourced to multiple levels, it turned out to be not so great. Um, and, uh, and, and so we had to, you know, a number of those batteries have had a much shorter life than, than expected. So that's caused some, some customer unhappiness. Um, we since implemented a few, a few months ago a much better screening of the battery packs um, and, uh, and now have a, a, a substantially improved pack uh, going into cars. Great, thank you. This concludes our Q&A session. I will turn it back to Jeff Evanson for closing remarks. All right, Patrick, well, I don't have much to say, but thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and look forward to talking with you next quarter. Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for participating in today's program. This concludes the program. You may all disconnect. <laughs>